What's going on, guys? This is Matt Maroff, and my co-host today is Rick Hauser. You know, you might have known him from his early days when he went by Doogie when he was on that show, Doogie Hauser. And since then, obviously, he's been pretty busy. He's been working in real estate. So let's give a little uh, intro of who Rick is. Rick Hauser started in the real estate industry in 2003, where he acquired his skills in real estate investing. Rick took his information and his tools of the construction background and put it into flipping houses. To me, that's pretty impressive. And I know Rick's going to agree with me. There's a lot of people out there that are wholesalers that turn wholesalers, investors, and for, you know, for very, better lack of uh, purpose or reason, um, they don't have the proper training. And the majority of those wholesalers that do these rehabbers actually fail because they don't have construction background. Um, he decided to get into the real estate industry and, and pursue a full-time career at uh, helping investors, buyers, sellers achieve their real estate goals basically over the short. Uh, uh, and he's also worked with and been involved in many short sales. Rick is somebody that I've actually spoke with over the course of, I don't even know how many years we've been friends. It's been a long time. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a long time, but you know, we have, uh, spoke back and forth and we and we and we talked about different cases that we had so rick is somebody that i look to in the industry that you know um and there's not many people i would say with peers in the industry that know what they're doing but he's definitely one of them um let's talk a little bit about his real estate career uh being in real estate um included in best of the bucks uh realtors uh multi-year winner in the philly magazine five-star award president circles club uh, when he worked for, uh, what is it, uh, BHHS, Fox and Roach Realtors, uh, and then recently moved over to a more successful broker, Homestore Realty. Uh, <clears throat> Rick has once established his main focus in helping distressed homeowners, where now runs a successful short sale business, helping homeowners, investors achieve, um, obviously, their aspects in the industry, putting all those tools together. Rick is founded. Uh, Rick Hauser Group, along with um, the Hauser Home Restoration, Inc. This guy's been in business 17 years, so let's give him a big round of applause and welcome to the show. Uh, Rick Hauser, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Matt. Look at that. You, got, you actually got a round of applause. Look at you. How you do? You got a button over there? I got a little button, a little tool. <laughs> Listen, this I, thought it was a car, I thought it was a card shuffle. No, dude, this isn't a uh, – I know it's like a low-price show over here. You know, we're working uh, bare bones minimum. Rick. It works, man. Absolutely, 100%. So I know we've known each other. We have to know each other for at least a minimum. I'm going to say eight years maybe. I was going to say eight to ten. Yeah, easily, brother. About eight to ten years. So, you know, I would say right probably, let's say eight to ten. So I went nationwide five years ago. You focus in your little market, which is which is great. I have a team behind me that is helping people, um, and I have a quest because and we've talked about this, where real estate agents don't want to go for you know continuous education credits because they're not getting their CT credits or they don't see the action added value. Tell me what your feeling is on the real estate industry. Let's talk about Main Street, uh, a mainstream real estate first. What do you mean? As far as agents go, the whole industry, or what? as far as the industry itself, and let's talk about how agents work in mainstream environment because we also talked about that agents don't go for continuous training on how to become uh, uh, a better uh, real estate agent, more compassionate okay. agent, stuff like that. You know, Pennsylvania. I mean, here in Pennsylvania, every two years we have to take continuing education classes. You know what I mean? They can be done. On the internet, you can go to pay to go to the course in the classroom, that kind of thing. You know, yeah. it's big on ethics. You know, they uh, got to take the ethics course, which is great. Right. So, you know, it can get, you know, unethical out there sometimes, you know, especially with this whole COVID thing that just happened. Some agents were still showing houses, you know, right. so doing work when they weren't supposed to be doing that. Um, right. You know, you know, I see. I see agents steering away from the short sale stuff because they quote unquote take too long. You know what I'm saying? Um, mm -hmm. but, but they don't educate themselves too much in the short sale stuff. Uh, right. you know, I mean, 
that's just Pennsylvania. Across the board, you would know more about that than me as far as agents go. I don't mm -hmm. deal with too many agents throughout the country like you do. Know. You know what I mean? Got it. Understood. So, I mean, obviously, right now we're talking about mainstream real estate in, in the Pennsylvania area, specifically, you said Bucks County, correct? Yep, Bucks County, Philadelphia, Montgomery County is my uh, little tri county areas that I work. You know, I get, I do, I do business in Jersey um, as far as the short sale stuff goes for investors. You know, and I've done, you know, I've closed short sales throughout the country, actually. Um, I've actually. Uh, I've closed a short sale in the CVS parking lot where the uh, one partner was in Seattle and the other one was in Italy at the time. Right. So, I mean, it can be done anywhere, you know. 100%. Do you think that the, the majority of people are afraid of, I know we keep skating over to the distress side, but let's talk about uh, mainstream. Do you feel that um, real estate in general, realtors in general are afraid of failure, but also afraid of, Success? Uh, I don't know. I mean, that's kind of a loaded question, really. I mean, I think I think realtors get into real estate. People get into real estate. Let's start from the beginning. Let's just say that. You get into real estate because it's good money, okay? It can be fast, quick money. But the more you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it. Um, you know, as far as real estate goes, I mean, it's – I don't, there's so many different personalities out there of, of agents, man. You know, some, some want to do the work and, and put the time in. Some just don't, you know, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> I'll say this flat out, man. I say it all the time and uh, with all due respect to, to the industry, yeah. don't, give a, don't, don't give a license to a monkey. Okay. And, uh, but again, it's, it's what you put into it, you know, and the time that you put into it and how you do it. People may get mad at me for saying it, but it is what it is. Well, look, I think at the end of the day, I think the, the main issue that we have is that uh, real estate agents in general have this glamorous thinking that it's going to be like HGTV, where they're going to go out to gonna show properties. Well, that's not the case. And, and you know, real estate agents and consumers, quite frankly, you know, it's right. not HGTV. Um, mm -hmm. like people say to me all the time, well, on on TV or, or on HCTV or, you know, they said, so who, who, who's that first of all? Mm -hmm. okay. And you, you throw the disc, throw the CD, throw the, throw that stuff in the trash. It doesn't mm -hmm. not real world experiences, you know, um, agents, they, they get into it for uh, sometimes for the wrong reasons because they, they think it's quick money um, or it can be a part-time gig, which it can be. You know, real estate can be a part-time thing for people, and they can be very successful at it as well. But then it depends on your, your, you know, your your personal situation as well. You know, um, failure. I mean, for me personally, failure is never an option for anything. Um, that goes back to a person's personality. You know, they may be scared to do their first transaction, but after they do that, I've seen I've seen agents come in this industry scared to death of their own shadow mm -hmm. and become superstars once trained properly. And I guess that leads off to your training uh, question. If you're trained properly and trained correctly, you can be a superstar in this industry. Yeah. So I mean, obviously we do have a lot of people that invest in themselves or at least find a mentor and be able to get guided. Uh, I, you know, I say to, uh, I don't want to say, you know, the dark side, the wrong side, but at least find a direction, uh, find a niche or some people say niche in the market and go with it don't bounce all over the place you well that's the thing too is, is the niche you, you, you get into your niche you know and a lot of times when you first get into the industry it's you get over educated there's so much going on um that you lose focus focus is a main key time blocking focus is, is key in this industry obviously there's a lot of problems with that where people for whatever reason don't want to take the time they don't want to do time blocking they're flying all over the place look uh, you are actually helping me out today because I had fallout from somebody that was supposed to come on one of the lives. And I said, when are you available? He said, when do you need me? And I said, jokingly, tomorrow. And he said, hey, look, if you need me, I'll switch around a couple appointments. I'll pop on. How long is it? I said, 45 minutes, an hour. Let's do it. Yeah. Well, you could have been like, no, I'm not interested. Let's do it in another week or two. So I appreciate you bailing me out today and coming on 
and and uh, and taking the time to you know obviously you know share some of your knowledge with people. Well, that's what friends do, man. I mean, we've been like you said, we've known each other a long time, brother. You know, what I mean? yeah. And you, you know, you help me out too. You know, certain things. So, well, well, and I appreciate that. There's a couple of questions that I want to ask you, um, based on the fact that we do run parallel. And guys, here's a perfect example, right? I don't look at people as competition. Rick doesn't look at people as competition, right? We look at people as opportunity, right? So Rick does short sales. I do short sales. He does mainstream real estate. He does a couple of different things. So question, why do you think, um, or what's your, what is your thinking as far as, you know, uh, wh why people think that they can just do a short sale? Because the word short sale is still sexy. Um, you know, the word short sale has been around for a long time, uh, ever. Okay. Um, it became sexy in 2008, 2009. It was the, the new thing. Um, so they thought, oh, I can just do a short sale. Well, mm -hmm. what I find personally is if this, a lot of time, if people are behind on their mortgage, two, three, four, five, I don't know, a year, I actually find sometimes that there's still equity in the house. They'll come to me and they'll say, oh, I just want to do a short sale. Okay, well, let's mm -hmm. stop. Let's pause a moment. Let's gather our information. And then let's say you have equity in your house. You know that. We don't need to do a short sale. Oh, so, you know, it's just that word. It, it just pops up to everybody. It's, it's, just, it's that sexy word. Um, yeah. I also find people that that are underwater, that are in possibly for, or are in foreclosure, mm -hmm. and do a short sale. Okay, well, there's there's layers to that on you, as you know. You know, uh, depending on the servicer, depending on the, the note holder, uh, depending on, the, the, you know, the, the type of mortgage it is, there's different types of short sales. So there's huge different buckets. And a lot, a lot of times homeowners will say, I'm going to do a short sale. Okay, this is the process we need to go through. And they'll get approved for, say, a modification. Well, why did they approve me for the modification? I just want to do a short sale. Because we have to go through the steps, the process, to get to that short sale. Now, mm -hmm. you either accept that modification if you want, or, <laughs> or default on it, whatever the case may be. You have your option. But we're giving them options, and we're, we're helping them stay in their homes. Right. Um, so not to get off point, but you know, I think a lot of people, it's just a sexy word. They just want to do a short sale. Well, I appreciate that. Um, well, I don't think what people don't understand is the purpose of uh, the investor and the guidelines that they have to follow. And let's face it, a lot of these investor guidelines are a little outdated. Yeah, extremely. I try to make it as easy as possible for homeowners to understand the process. And, you know, when I, you know, depending on the investor and if they want to do a waterfall review, which is what you're talking about, you know, with the loan modification. And sometimes when they're doing that, they're not even using their finances to come out with a number. What uh, you, you're laughing. What's your thought on that? There, what'd you say? What is your thought on that? That they're not even using their finances, and it's like they're shooting a number into the sky out of a can and go, "Here's your payment." Well, my thought on that is. Um Delay, delay, delay. Uh, remember, well, you know this. When the property closes, whether it closes at sheriff sale, whether it closes through short sale, whether they take the, the, the lender or the servicer takes it back at, at, at anything, the servicer gets paid what they're owed. The servicer doesn't get shorted. The investor gets shorted. So I think that that number comes out of the sky magically. Um, I've seen loan mods is the same amount of money that they're paying $30 less. Like how can you, but that's also educating the consumer on when they're filling out that paperwork, what the underwriter is going to be looking for in order to make the loan modification happen, you know? Um, but I also think that the, the service is really delay the process on, 
getting the file to the loan mod or giving them that loan mod for three months, which is probably unrealistic to hold on to that, to service it for another three months and get their money another three months and do that over a hundred, hundred, hundred files. That's a lot of money. So, you know, when I talk about the waterfall review with loan modification, mm -hmm. or as I call them loan mods, is there is a, there is, there's a purpose which you're talking about as far as the servicer, but there's a number that they throw out. The numbers that they're throwing out, regardless of the paperwork that I've seen that's been submitted on financials, they're just giving a number. Now here, I'm gonna give a perfect example. There was a house that was abandoned. There was a house where pipes blew in the property. There was a house, the short sale was in process. There was a house that an investor said, hold up, uh, or the servicer said, we're gonna, we're gonna put the file through a waterfall review. And I said, well, my team actually said, the property is um, not occupied. It is literally not habitable. The pipes blew in the house. And you're telling me that you're going to give these fine folks the opportunity to try to, you know, make good and keep the mortgage payment on their house? That's correct. Sometimes, I don't know if you feel it, but I feel it. I feel like I'm talking to a robot on the other side. It's like where they're reading the script. Well, yeah, you're talking to a robot. And the funny thing is, if you hang the phone up and then call back, you'll be a different person. They'll tell you something different, too. Are you trying to say that they're disorganized on the other side and they don't notate the file correctly or they don't put notes in it at all? 110%. Well, the notes that they put in there are completely inaccurate because the notes that I put in are accurate notes. Right. I notes it and I'm reading the notes and they're reading what they're reading back to me. It's like, what are you talking about? First right. of all, you know, I mean, the waterfall effect with FHA, you know, I, they got to follow that and they're, they're definitely robots. You know, but you have to be when it comes to that persistent, 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 persistent to get to the right person. I mean, I'll spend, man, I'll spend two to three hours on the same file, making the same phone calls to get to the right person to explain the properties vacant. Look, here's pictures. There's holes in the ceiling. There's mice running through the walls. Right. You really want to do, a, you know. Want to go through a waterfall review? Seriously? And once you get past the robot, it, you know, it's different. Well, the other thing is also, too, is, is that you, you know, you, there's different expectations, obviously, of buyers that are coming in and they're looking to purchase the property. You know, when you have um, a buyer that comes in and says, well, this is going to be the repair value, and then you have the investors or the oh. servicers that are sending people out, and you know you have the right estimate. And then you ask them, well, what did the value come in at? Can't tell you. What's the repairs coming in at? I can't disclose it to you. Okay. Well, what about the homeowner? Can the homeowner find out? Sure. It's such a stupid game because we already have authorization to have to go to the homeowner. And then the homeowner, nine times out of 10, says they never got it, got to resend it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like two weeks before you get it. Now you got it and you're looking at it and you go, how is this repair estimate $85,000 when I'm looking at the bank repair estimate and it's saying it always needs $13,000? makes no sense. Well, you know, that's your wonderful world of appraisers there, you know. Um, and, <laughs> you know, when it, <laughs> I, I see that all the time, Matt. I mean, that is all the time, constant. Um, and then you, you supply them with your own photos and say, look, you're, you're wrong on your value. And right. they don't hear it. I don't. They and, and that you know that's a whole nother you know uh, mathematical equation if you want to call it with the asset managers. You know mm -hmm. they think that they can get more at uh, auction, you know, or at the sheriff's mm -hmm. sale. So I mean, the, the the bank's values are sometimes I don't get. Sometimes they're right. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll hand it to the bank. I'll, I'll give credit where credit's due. Sometimes mm -hmm. I feel as though their values are right, and it is what it is, and here we are. Okay, um, it's the buyers that don't understand. Sometimes they'll say, you know, but it's not worth that. Well, it's, the bank has an appraisal, and yes, it is. You know, um, I, you know what I find interesting too. Why are we, if we do a value, why, if I hire an independent appraiser 
to do a value dispute. Mm -hmm. Or I can just do a value dispute with comps. Why am I not allowed to use distressed properties or REO properties, but their appraisal is allowed to? That's, the answer I get is that's correct. And I go, but that's not an answer. That's <laughs> correct. Yeah. I, but, yeah you're, you're talking to the wall sometimes. Exactly. It's like they're, <laughs> they're very political. It's like you're calling the White House. <laughs> but that's the part I don't get. Why are they allowed to do things that we're not? You know what I mean? Like it's do as I say, not as I get to do. And I can, and that's okay. I believe me. I, I I live by that, but I don't like what it's played against me. You know. <laughs> no, I understand. But so you know, so buyers don't understand the bank values, and you try to explain it to them. And I think you can agree, or you might even disagree. Feel free to disagree with anything I say. Yeah. If you know, there's two two different types of short sales, in my opinion. Um, there's a retail short sale and there's an investor short sale. Would you agree on that or disagree? When you say investor, how big of a bucket is that? Is that a rehab investor or are we talking about wholesale investors? Still? I don't listen. I don't even acknowledge wholesalers I know you don't. half the time because I don't think when it comes to distressed real estate, they're really adding value. If anything, they're causing more of a headache for people like myself. Um, and they feel that they're demanded a fee for something that they've really done nothing except step out of the way and say, take care of this. Let me know when we get an approval. And then, uh, you know, I'm going to bring in a buyer. Not interested. So for me. That's a, that's a whole other Facebook live conversation with other, other individuals. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm talking about, so when I say retail, I'm okay. talking about end users. When okay. I say when I say investors, I'm talking about investors that are going to purchase the property. They're going to either uh, fix it and turn it uh, for a yeah. profit, or they're going to keep it and obviously they're going to, they're going to cash flow it. Sure. Well, what was the question? <laughs> the question is, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but there's two different types of short sales. Okay. Like either a retail short sale or if there's a, um, you know, an investor short sale. Okay. Yeah. So you agree with me? I agree with you. Okay. So we're talking about how the buyers are not understanding what, when it comes to the bank value. So when... So, so when an investor wants to purchase a property and they say, well, look, the matrix doesn't work for me and I can't buy it at that number, we have to keep going in. At some point, you know, we have to exhaust all efforts and say, look, you're going to be deemed a non-performing buyer. The, the bank will shut the file down and or they'll keep coming back and saying, OK, look, at this point, you know, now we have to look, take a closer look at the file and say, is there some type of fraud that may or may not be going on? Put the property back on the market. You ever get a situation where an investor is just holding on, like they've got no other transactions, they've got no other possibilities, there's no other drinking fountain that they can go to? It's like, it, it's like they can't go to another additional uh, uh, gas station and pump gas. They got pump gas at that one station. I don't really come across that. You know, look, if somebody, a lot of times my files are, you know, I, I don't deal in the in the volume that you do. Um, you know, you'll handle 100 at a time. I'll handle 25 at a time, you know. Um, so a lot of my files, I do things backwards. I, I guess you could say sometimes I have a lot of old school um, methods that I still use, meaning before the property goes on the market, I'm pulling a title report. I want to know what other liens and yeah, exactly why 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 the servicers can't understand that I don't get it but anyway you know I pull the title report I want to know what kind of liens or judgments are there right away all right I'll even go sometimes as far as you know calling the water department or the township cedars water and sewer things like that that may be in the process stuff like that anyway um so when I when it comes to the number here's the number so the investor will say well the house is not worth. 200,000. It's only worth 150. Well, I understand that, but this is the number the bank wants. Okay. We can all, we can submit 150, but here's how we got to do it. Let's just hypothetically say we submitted 150, bank goes back, they don't want it, 190, 180, whatever. 
Mm-hmm. Nestor says, well, no, I want to stay at 150. All right, well, guess what? The seller has the option to terminate the agreement sale. This is Pennsylvania, okay? Um, so just I advise the seller correctly. You know, look, you can terminate with this investor. It's fine. Right. Um, have a nice day. So, no, they can't tie up the agreement sale like that. Um, as far as the retailing goes, same thing. It is what it is. Um, you know, as it, here's a, I have a file right now that the bank has the appraised value of 191. The house isn't worth 191. Okay, uh, the appraisal w- is good for 12 months. Mm-hmm. Okay, the, the bank's appraisal and their appraisal was probably three months old now, four months old now. The house has gotten in bad shape. Probably mm-hmm. worth realistically 145. Mm-hmm. The only way to get it done is for the retail buyer, because investors don't want to pay for appraisals. Is the retail buyer put the agreement sale together, go through your mortgage process. Order the appraisal. I can then use that appraisal to your advantage, mm-hmm. you know, to get the property. Um, but I guess, I guess to go back a little bit before things too. Um, buyers think short sales are a deal. They can be, but the banks still sell them at fair market value. You know what I mean? Um, not to get back off topic again there, but you know, they really do, you know, and the total reports are huge. The total report tells the story of how you can unwind it really. And on certain files and certain investors, and you know, this, they will only allow certain things to be paid. Like yeah. if there's a lien or a judgment, you know, like they're not going to pay a water sewer lien of $3,000. They're just not going to pay. Mm-hmm. So I need to know that the buyer can, can pay it or we can absorb it in the cost of it. So, I mean, titles, titles really important. So the problem that we've had in the past is where, and this, this actually incenses me because you're pulling the title report. We have the the train of thought that is if it's a, if it's a retail sale, it really should be the buyer request and whoever they want to use for a title. But when the property is in distress, you're laughing already. When the property is in distress, the seller should have the right to use whatever title company they want to try to figure out what issues are going to be there to convey their clear title to whoever the next owner might be of the property. Now, we go through all the work, we get what we need, and we actually have it in our disclosure paperwork that says, look, this is what we're doing. The property was only was in motion. Uh, if you're not, you know, a, a current buyer or the buyer before we move forward with the short sale uh, for review, we're utilizing a title company that we work with. Everything is in the paperwork. We did it specifically for that reason. Now, sure. you'll get a title company and or attorney or a buyer who gets cute and says, I'm not closing unless I use my title company. Now, a couple of different things could happen. If there's a sale date coming up, obviously we don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers. We want the transaction to go through. But then the title company that did all the work helping us clearing the title so that person can reap the benefits of purchasing the property, title companies make the same amount of money across the board. It's a fee schedule that they have. That's it. So the only other reason why I could think, and I've called people out, and I've pissed off a lot of people, how much of a vig is it that you're getting off of the title that's going to make such of a difference? Was it two, three hundred dollars, whatever? It is? You want a credit? We'll give you a credit. But at the end of the day, when you have a specific title company or title companies that are doing this work for you ahead of time, so you know how to plot out, it's like putting a foundation. Perfect example. You come from a building background. So you can't build a house without a proper foundation. You can't start a short sale without a proper title work. Correct. Well, that there's there's <laughs> we could we could spend we could talk about this the whole time. So why in Pennsylvania, okay, it's the buyer's choice for title. Mm-hmm. Okay, I do the same thing that you do. Disclose, you know, uh, we've had we have title report here. Uh, we can submit it to you within five days of fully executed agreement sale. Um, and I can tell the agent, this is, this is how we're going to unwind this because at the end of the day, our reputation is on the line, realistically, 
because the agent, the, the, the sellers, the, the buyer's agent, the seller's agent, the title company, the mortgage company, the brokerages, it all comes back to us, okay? And we're on the hook to, to get the transaction closed. So there's a few things with that. Now, if you've ever read RESPA, and I don't know if you have, if you read the definitions of RESPA, RESPA's, RESPA is only geared towards federally governed secured loans. So if it's a cash deal, that means that the seller can, in fact, choose their title company or, and make the buyer use the title company. All right. Um, so if you read the definitions of RESPA, that's that's the one thing. That's a slippery slope that, that people don't really like to go down. Because right away, it's, well, that's a RESPA violation. Well, no, it's really not, right? Um, a lot of times if that does happen, you charge the buyer back. Sometimes it's about 350 bucks for the title company to pull that title report. So you can be creative and find a way to charge the buyer back that 350 to pay your title company back and you have that relationship with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then a lot of times it happens with the buyer's agents because they have title shares within their brokerages. So I don't know if you know this or not, you very well may, but there's a lot of dirty little real estate secrets out there. Um, so some brokerages, uh, I'm not going to name names, but you can buy, because you're not allowed, to, you can't do kickbacks, that's illegal, right? So what the brokerages do, they have they own the title companies, because that's really where they make their money, quite frankly, is through profit share. So as an agent, you can buy X amount of shares of the title company. Well, when the title company does X amount of volume for that quarter or month or average structure, the right. agent gets their, their money back on title. So that's a lot of times why they push to use their title. Right. At the end of the day, you know, it's about education. I can personally say I capture about 90% of my seller files that I have title reports are reported to the buyer's agents. And, and 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 I really think that's because of reputation more than anything. It's just right. it's just you know uh, I got it done. Here it is. Here's the problem on title. We already have a pulled. And and working with your title company is a huge huge advantage to everybody involved. And I only say that because if I need something, if I need a HUD done or, or an alt done right away, and I'm calling. This other guy's title company that don't know me from a can of paint. Okay. Guess what? I'm getting put on the back line. We'll get to it when we get to it. If I call you and say, I need this, you're going to jump right on it for me because you're my title company and we're getting shit done right away. Right. Call me. You know, so it's that's why title is so important and people just don't understand it. You know, 100%. And a lot of brokers don't understand it either, which is, which is sad because right away it's, well, we have to pull title, it costs us money. The fall. It's a short sale. If the file doesn't close, then we're on the hook for that money. Well, let me ask you this question. So, and we'll get into this next question that I want to ask you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that about not closing. What the hell would somebody want to work on a file? You know, I train people. So, one of the, you're shaking your head because you already know the answer. Negative Nancy, man. What's that? Negative Nancy's. The glass is empty. Listen, why would somebody want to work on a file for three, four months? Let's say six months ago. Okay, cool. We got an approval. Let's let's go into the title. Then they look at the title and go, oh, shit, this deal's dead. Why not go from the beginning and take care of everything? So, you know, what did they say? High sign is 2020. Um, okay. So what do you see in the market as far as a shift, a shift with the stress? Um, you know, with the distressed property market uh, during the whole COVID-19 thing. What's, what is your take on it? My take is there, I don't believe there's any face masks for the lenders as far as the forbearances go, except Fannie Mae stepped in and kind of is leading the pack on that. Right. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, yep. Exactly. To, to relieve that kind of thing. So, However, I also think they're the two that have figured out how to do short sales the best, quite frankly. Um, but regardless, I think it's going to change a little bit. I think that uh, I think we're going to have a little bit of a spike again. I really do. 
Um, and I don't think that'll happen until January of next year. Mm -hmm. We are in an election year. Um, of course, December, nobody forecloses on houses in December. Um, mm -hmm. They want to tell you it's because of the holidays, which it's not, you know, it's because it's November's the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, I think it's going to, I think there's going to be a, I think there's going to escalate when it comes to short sales and I'll be my, I see short sales constantly every day, just like you. So I never see them going away. Okay. Um, I know the value that we are able to offer people is here. Um, they're never going to go away. I just think it's going to spike a little bit. I also think, I don't know why it didn't happen. Because I expected, I I thought it was what was going to happen last year with the baby. Mm -hmm. As far as these, you know, uh, folks older than my, myself that put their kids through college, pay for these big fat weddings and things like that. Now one of the spouse passes away or whatever the case may be, and they can't afford the house. They both pass away. Now the kids are stuck with the estate. There's no equity in the home. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was surprised not to see that. Last year, quite frankly, um, but I if if it's the perfect storm, I could see that happening at the beginning of next year, and I think that it's going to the shit's going to hit the fan. Mm -hmm. Fan in a, as it did in the eight and nine, but I think we're going to think it's going to hit the hand, shit's going to hit the fan a little bit. So, you know, there's still obviously a, a scratch and dent, distressed real estate, whatever you want to call it, loans collateral paperwork gone wrong uh, from 2008, 2009, you know, when the market started to turn in 2007. And then, mm -hmm. you know, things really started to get haywire. Um, so we have that. Then we have the loan modifications from 2013, 2014 that failed, which was going to add to, in my opinion, 2020 2021 adjustment in the market and they got COVID 19. so it's really a, a, an effect of a trifecta that's going to cause the issues that we're going to have right now yeah uh you know in the market itself and i didn't even think about that about the the, the refis and everything in 2014 and stuff like that i didn't even put that into effect think about that very across my mind see what i learned today take that perfect example but so, yeah. so the thing is is that I have no problem collaborating with people that want to collaborate. Obviously, you're somebody that I can collaborate with. But there's a lot of people that are closed off or they don't want to deal with real estate. I mean, how many agents have you come across and you ask them, you know, are you going after distressed real estate? Or they'll start a thing with you. I don't know, Rick, I don't know how the hell you do what you do. I have no interest in doing it. Whereas they can just get a referral fight. My wife was just talking to me today. She was, Matt, I might have a deal, um, a house in California. Watch my phone's gonna start ringing. Uh, in, in California, um, for a listing for a five six hundred thousand dollar listing, a license in California, but I can refer it out. Sure. So you get twenty five percent of that. That's like what thirty one hundred bucks or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You know, for doing really nothing, making a phone call because you know uh, of your the connections. And they always say, you know, yeah, what is it? Your your net worth is your network or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, it, it's crazy when you say that because uh, I think everybody can always do your job better than you. You know what I mean? They can, um, have, they can have my job. You know, oh, I love my job. I love what I do. I, I love what I do. I, I get up in the morning and, and I, I just, I have a high to do what I do. I enjoy it. I love what I do. Um, I also, but there's also, you got to keep that ego in check too. You know, um, there's a difference between, being good at your job and good, good at what you do and being an asshole. Now I can be an asshole. I'll own that. I know I can be an asshole and that's okay. 100%. You know what I mean, that's fine. Um, and I'll apologize for being an asshole and an asshole. But at the end of the day, here we are, we want to get from A to B. We have to get along right now. After that, then we don't have to, you can think what you want about me, everything else. Some agents, Oh, I, <laughs> I just, <laughs> you're saying this, I had an agent about a month ago I reached out to, and uh, he said, hey, I said, well, you have a short sale, you know, if you need any help with it, things like that. And what she said to me, I, I said, very well, good luck. 
she closes 100, she's closed 100% of her short sales, Pat. 100%. And my question was, well, how many have you done? Uh, well, you know, 20, 25. That's great. Because I can tell you right now, I, I haven't closed 100% of my short sales. You know what I mean? And there's reasons why, you know, whether it be the homeowner, whether it be the lender, whether it be foreclosure, whatever the case may be, you know, look, I'm not perfect. You know what I mean? But I can, I know that I did the best I could do every day. Um, agents, I find some agents go after short sales. I have a few agents that go after short sales or go after distressed property owners because they have the backing. They have me behind them to the, the support system there. You know what I mean? Um, and that's, you know, uh, others, they can do the job better than me. They don't need me. They don't want me. Okay, that's fine. But then they'll call me when the shit's really ugly. <laughs> and then I got to fix the problem. You know, you had mentioned and you said that you, you know, you love getting up. You love what you do. You love the short sales. What I was trying to make a comment is let somebody take a long walk in my shoes and what I have to deal with on a daily basis. Cause for me, we got a ghost in the house over there. Your lights are flickering. That's a ghost. Is that your wife saying, Rick, come on, lunch is ready. That's my wife hitting the switch probably because it's she's probably watching and the bulbs are probably bothering her in the background. Cause you know, everything's gotta be perfect. You know, <laughs> no, no, I got you. I got you. So, you know, you said you had stated that, you know, you like getting up. You love you. Do. I love what I do, but I can tell you right now, I don't think many people could get through my stressful day, day in and day out, and not have a nervous breakdown. There's a lot of pressure. <laughs> There's a lot of pressure on guys like you and me. We take a lot on. I'm lucky. I got a team behind me that is, you know, working, you know, diligently, mm -hmm. making sure that thing, thing, these things are going through. Or that we get into the process. Look, we're at a 96% success rate in getting short sale approvals. Now, mm -hmm. that doesn't guarantee you things are going to the closing table. Of course. That just means, you know, something's going to happen where, so when, you know, when people talk about, you know, fictitious numbers, and I'm a 100% close ratio, I've heard it all. Four, I've done 100%. Cool. How many deals have you done? Five. That's Good. Good. In a month? No, over the course of like four years. Great. Yeah. So I, I so everybody has different perspective with that. It so is. But you know, I have a lot of stress. It's it's but I uh I think I've learned to manage it a little bit. Um as far as I, I I can't bring it in my house of sorts. You know what I mean? It's uh you know, I gotta leave it outside and then deal with it, you know, when I'm working of sorts. But we're always on call. We're 24-7. You know what I mean? No, 100%. So, I mean, look, Rick, I'm going to leave your information up here why I intro out. Uh, but, <clears throat> Rick, I love having you on as a guest. This is Rick Hauser. Um, Rick, I might be doing a panel uh, in the next month or two. I'd love you to come on as one of the panelists um, and talk about short sales. It's all about not looking at people as competition more of a, as an opportunity so that would be fun to have you on there you know what matt you know i i i, I this is my thought i'd rather i don't want to be the one guy on my million dollar yacht i'd rather be with 10 other people on our one hundred thousand dollar yachts so no, I, I agree more to murder you yeah, know no, at the end of every single one of these lives that I'm doing, uh, I'm doing the finger point. So I'm trying to figure out who can actually do it. So I don't know if you can do the finger that, point. Well, you got you got to get in. You get in like this, and I got to get my hair pulled back so I got the receding hairline, and then you get the finger point like that. Where's that? There it is, right there. It is. Good. And I'll take it. I'm going to give you. A, I'm going to give you a seven. A seven, huh? I'm going to give you a seven for effort. Effort. Well, yeah, you got to give 100%. You know what I mean? No, I hear you. But I'm going to give you a seven. Guys, Rick Hauser is my guest today. Um, he is uh, with the company. It is Homestar Inc., correct? Homestar Realty is my brokerage. Okay. 
And then okay. I had my own Rick Hauser group, which is my traditional real estate. And then I had Hauser Home Restorations, which is my short sale distressed property all around, you know, consulting real estate business. Guys, if you want to reach out to Rick directly, his cell phone number is 267-549-3922. Again, his cell number is 267-549-3922 or Rick at RickHauser.com. Um, and then obviously you can also reach him on one of his websites, which is a home star with two R's in it, Inc.com. Rick, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate you coming on short notice and bailing me out. Matt, thanks for having me, brother. Absolutely. Hold on one sec. Don't go anywhere. Okay. Guys, this is Rick Hauser, uh, and uh, Rick uh, does mainstream real estate. He also does short sales in Bucks County, uh, Pennsylvania. As you know, Monday through Friday, it is about information and talking with other people in the industry. And, yeah, I don't have a problem bringing other people on that are in the same line of work that I'm on. Remember, guys, it's not competition. It's always about opportunity. Monday through Friday, 12 p.m., Tuesdays and Thursday nights, one available. We dig deep, and we talk a little bit more underneath, a really rip the layers back and talk about really what's going on within the distressed market. Until next time, Matt Marinoff, Real Estate Recovery Group. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Matt. You got it, bud.